Let's take a final look at what a patient is. You and a patient are only about 10% mammal by cell count. A patient consists of about 10 trillion mammal cells and about 90 trillion bacteria, viral, and fungal cells. Moreover, in that assemblage, which we call the microbiome, there are about 300 times as many unique bacterial genes as there are human genes in the human body. This assemblage has an ancient coevolutionary history. Interventions early in life that affect the microbiome have big downstream consequences on health. They include C-sections, breastfeeding, antibiotic treatments, and hygiene. And the result of that is that if these are perturbed, we can see allergies, asthma, obesity, and autoimmune disease, or at least increased risk of them. Some of the best evidence of coevolution is co-development and let me expand on what that means. Our gut is actually our largest immune organ. It wouldn't surprise you, I think, to realize that we gather our defenses around a part, a part of the body where invasion by bacteria is most likely. The development of lymphoid tissue around the gut, the so-called gut-associated lymphoid tissue, or GALT, is triggered by signals that are produced by gut bacteria. That's a very interesting observation. It means that the mammalian genome has outsourced this critical developmental decision to develop the immune system, at a, an important part of the body, to another genome, to a bacterium. That could only have happened if there has been a very long association of bacteria with mammal guts in a way that, in fact, the presence of the bacteria is just as reliable as the presence of any other part of our body. This has been demonstrated on azenic infant rabbits. So an azenic rabbit is one that's born without any microflora at all and where the bacteria are then introduced into the gut experimentally. And Bacterioides fragilis is one of the bacteria that's capable of giving this signal. The interaction doesn't stop there. There is continuing crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune system, and that helps to maintain our immunological balance. Patients that have mutations in their NOD receptors, which are part of the receptors that activate the innate immune system, and which recognize what are called PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, help to mediate Crohn's disease, and if in other words, if the receptors for this kind of signal coming in from the gut are not there, then an important type of immune deficiency disease results, an inflammatory bowel disease. Let's take a look at a bit of the detail in the gut as it's colonized. So here is the prenatal gut on the left and the postnatal gut on the right. And this is the gut epithelium here. The gut lumen is to the top. The gut epithelium has in it dendritic cells and goblet cells and lymphocytes and things like that. Below the epithelium, there are Peyer's patches, which are not very fully developed, and mesenteric lymph nodes, not fully developed prenatally. And then after they are stimulated by the presence of bacteria after birth, the Peyer's patches and these lymph nodes develop into the gut-associated lymphoid system. A Peyer's patch is essentially a special gut-adapted lymph node. And out of these are being produced all sorts of things that are regulating the interaction, including immunoglobulin. Uh, it's the major immunoglobulin in gut, in gut mucus. There are antimicrobial peptides that are being produced by Paneth cells. And these are all part of the way that the host is regulating its interaction with the huge community of bacteria that live in the gut. There are up to 10 to the 17th bacteria in the human gut. Interestingly, the gut epithelium is protected. There is an inner mucus layer that's nearly sterile, and the gut might microbiome, the, the bacteria living in the gut, are mostly in the outer mucus layer and out in the 
gut lumen. So this is the picture in the small intestine. This is the picture in the large intestine. There are more bacteria in the large intestine. However, there's quite a bit of regulation going on in both where you have things like panic cells and other cells that are producing both mucin and bacterial antipeptides and immunoglobulins to keep bacteria under control in that layer right above the intestinal epithelium. The microbiome develops in a complex manner over a number of generations. So there are things that happen before pregnancy that set up the situation in the mother before she gets pregnant. Then while the infant is developing in utero, all sorts of things can affect the kinds of bacteria that are living in and on the mother's body, including smoking, nutrition, uh, the cytokinin milieu, all sorts of things. Then during and just after delivery, the delivery method, vaginal or cesarean, and the use of perinatal antibiotics and the mode of feeding, breast or formula, all affect the initial colonization of the infant's gut. And then early in infancy, one of the most important things is infections, especially if they are treated with antibiotics, because antibiotics are going to be upsetting everything in the gut as well as in the site of infection, and things like exposure to smoke. So there's quite a series of environmental factors that can affect the gut microbiome. Well, we've learned that C-sections increase the risk of asthma and of other atopies. So an atopy is a hypersensitive allergic reaction. It's mediated by immunoglobulin E. There is often a genetic basis for atopies, but there is a gene by environment interaction. So these include hay fever, allergic conjunctivitis, allergic asthma, and eczema. If delivery is vaginal, then there is an initial colonization by E. coli and streptococcus, followed by a whole series of other bacteria, including bifidobacterium. And bifidobacteria stimulate the maturation of secretion of immunoglobulin A in saliva, and that may protect against allergy. If you wonder how that happens, just imagine the Infant has broken through its amniotic sac. It is being squeezed out of the uterus down the delivery canal. Its mouth is scraping against the wall of its mother's vagina. And as it comes out, it is centimeters away from her anus. And all of that area is uh, well colonized by bacteria. And it only takes a small inoculum to see the infant gut. In a cesarean delivery, things are much more hygienic, then other kinds of bacteria, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Clostridium, uh, invade. Clostridium can cause quite serious diarrhea. And children who are born by C-section have about a 20% increased risk of asthma. So these sorts of interventions, which make a lot of sense, especially if mother's health is at risk, have downstream consequences. Can we compensate for them? Well, a lot of people are now trying to develop, in a scientific way, probiotics that could be used to prevent atopies and autoimmune diseases. And here is a finished study where the use of probiotics from weaning up until age seven, so say in one to seven year olds, reduced the incidence of eczema. And it didn't eliminate it, but here are the placebos and here are the people who have been taking probiotics. And you can see that this difference here is about a 20% 20, 20 difference in the proportion healthy. So it has some ameliorative effect. What about obesity? And you might wonder, how could a C-section affect the risk of obesity? Well, our gut bacteria are involved in not only producing vitamins, but they're also involved in digesting our food. And they mediate the uptake of uh, both carbohydrates and fatty acids. 
So if you have a disturbed microbiome, the way that you digest your food will have changed, and that can result then in a risk of obesity. So here is the change in the risk of obesity in three-year-old children. These children were delivered vaginally. These children here were delivered with cesarean section. Okay, so this, this is the comparison just for overweight, and then this is for truly obese. This is where a, their body mass index is in the top 5%. Then, the next thing that happens, of course, is breastfeeding. And it turns out that breastfeeding is a very good idea, and that the children with and without allergies and eczema and things like that, with these different gut microbiomes, usually have been affected by how much breast milk they've had. So breastfed infants don't get as much E. coli, Clostridium difficile, and bacterioides. And if they have been able to continue breastfeeding for about three months, then they are protected. And so this is the difference here in asthma and in any kind of atopy, quite sig highly significantly different for formula and breastfed. Much higher on formula, much lower on breastfed. Breastfeeding may not only be mediating the risk of atopies, but also of obesity. And the mechanism may very well be metabolic programming. So breast milk would uh, increase the concentration of bifidobacteria. Infant formula would increase the concentration of firm firmicutase. This would, breast milk would increase folate, which would promote DNA methylation. Butyrates would promote histone acetylation. That would affect gene transcription and there would be long-term effects. So this is a hypothesis and the different elements in that chain of causation are being worked out. Now, this mechanism might be another case where we could compensate using probiotics. We could try to alter the proportion of bifidobacteria and firmicutase by including bifidobacteria in the diet. What about antibiotics? Antibiotics are often used in young children to treat, among other things, ear infections. And any course of antibiotics before the age of two years doubled the risk of hay fever and eczema in a study done in the UK. And early use of antibiotics increased the risk of obesity slightly. It was statistically significant, but you can see here from the difference in these lines, it wasn't a very big effect. So the impact on Hay fever and eczema seems to be pretty big, and the impact on the risk of obesity with antibiotics seems to be a bit smaller. Now, the impact of hygiene in a public health context can be very dramatic. The same sorts of people live in Finland and in Russian Karelia. They have very similar genetic backgrounds. They were all one population before the First World War. In children, the rate of Crohn's disease in Finland is about five times higher than it is in Karelia. They only have, only 5% of them have Helicobacter, whereas 73% of the kids in Karelia have Helicobacter. The income difference is huge. In Finland, it's about 25,000 per year. In Karelia, it's about 1,600 per year. And People in Finland have fewer pets than people in Karelia. There are similar differences in Hep A, toxoplasma, enteroviruses, and gut nematodes. So this is the annual incidence of type 1 diabetes by age in children who are between 0 and 14 years old. So there would be 0, and there's 14 there, in Russian Karelia and Finland. So in Karelia, it's lower and significantly lower than it is in Finland. This is the incidence per 100,000 people. Bottom line, it looks like a complex microbiome picked up by kids living in a poor, relatively dirty environment protects them against type 1 diabetes. So what are some of the mechanisms that might mediate this sort of thing? Well, it could be competition. It could be that the infectious agents being picked up in the microbiome are eliciting strong immune responses that compete with weaker responses that are elicited by allergens. 
It could be regulation. So one antigen's suppressive effect could be suppressing immune responses to other antigens. This is called bystander suppression. Infectious agents could stimulate regulatory cells to dampen autoimmune and allergic responses. Or it could be an impact on innate immunity. Infectious agents could activate the innate immune system by generating tolerogenic dendritic cells that activate tolerogenic Treg cells. We don't know which mechanism it is. The important outcome of whatever mechanism it is is that it looks like the gut ecosystem can be flipped between alternative stable states. If everything goes well and we have an infant environment which is colonized by a normal primary succession, we get into a healthy stable state. It resists colonization by microbes, okay? And positive feedback is go going to maintain the gut microbes in that healthy stable state. There could be a quick disturbance that degrades it, followed by complete recovery. That might be a short round of antibiotics or something like that. Or there could be incomplete recovery engendered by a, a larger perturbation or perhaps a less resilient ecosystem or a less resilient patient that leads to a degraded stable state, which is species poor, where there's simple metabolism. It's tolerant of inflammation rather than sensitive to inflammation. And it resists colonization by the microbes that belong in a healthy gut. So the question is, can we flip the microbiome between those states? Is it enough just to drink a probiotic or will actually the state of a degraded gut resist the colonization by those probiotics? That's an open question, but this is a useful uh, conceptual layout to see what, what the issues are that need to be addressed. So to summarize, the development and expression of our immune system have co-evolved with our microbiome. Interventions that perturb our microbiome change the risk of atopies, autoimmune disease, and obesity. These interventions include C-sections rather than vaginal delivery, formula rather than breast milk, and antibiotic treatments early in life, and then other forms of hygiene. The result is a mismatch. We have an altered microbiome, it's not the one we evolved with, and that produces a disease of civilization that's caused by the inability of biology to evolve as rapidly as culture can change.